Well, let's begin. I'm Roberta Baskin, and this is the Peace Studio Presents Images and Voices of Hope, our new dialogue series. And I just want to quickly make some introductions, and then we're going to do better a little later on. You're seeing Judy Rogers and Thomas West and Somite. And we're going to be joined later on by Ambassador Swanee Hunt. And we're going to put into practice something that Images and Voices of Hope has been doing for many years, that the Brahma Kumaris, who are one of the original hosts, founders of, of Images and Voices of Hope, introduced me to anyway. And it's called traffic control. And it's just a lovely way of settling your, your mind and your heart. And um, we can't see you. We can only see each other. But we know that there are this beautiful community of beating hearts out there for Images and Voices of Hope and the Peace Studio. And we want to take a moment with traffic control where Somite is going to play some beautiful music. And we're going to settle our minds and our hearts and go inside. And then we'll be right back. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Samate. So Images and Voices of Hope was um, founded by Judy Rogers 20 years ago, and uh, it captured my heart. I was a HD journalist and investigative reporter who couldn't wait to tell you about what's wrong with the world, about a company doing a bad thing. And through Images and Voices of Hope, um, it got me thinking about, instead, about resilience and hope, of course, and peace and uh, solutions. And, um, and one of the things that we practiced is appreciative inquiry. And Judy, I want to bring you in my old friend and mentor and um, talk a little bit about what was the origin story for you in terms of 1999, where you're thinking about what's going on in the world, especially in media, and, and thinking about, oh, we'll do this like one-off thing and bring media makers together. What was happening in the world that, that was the seed of this? Well, first, I want to just say hello and welcome to those of you who are here. Some of you looking at the registration, some of you out there know this story. You were at the tables and in the rooms. So um, in 1999, I always get credit for founding it, but actually there were many of us working on the project. And the feeling was that, um, and I had been in media, I'd worked in big media companies for a while. So uh, it came from two sources. One was the sense that the biggest export of the US actually was its media, that all of the, um, news and soap operas and 
movies and magazines and all the things we were shipping around the country and overseas, we were counting things. Media loves to count things. We counted Nielsen ratings, we counted box office receipts, we counted magazine subscriptions, but we weren't looking at the impact of what was happening with media. And it was beginning to bother me and it was beginning to bother a lot of people. So we got together with two other organizations, kind of strange bedfellows it seems, but actually there is a logic. So we decided to hold a conversation in Manhattan in June of 1999. And the three founders were uh, Case Western Reserve University, which as Roberta mentioned, is the home of something called Appreciative Inquiry, which is a strength-based approach to a lot of things, but especially to strategy and planning. Uh, the Visions of a Better World Foundation, which is no longer around and which um, was our civil sector partner. So CASE was our academic partner. The civil sector partner was the Visions Foundation and they were the fiduciary for the project. And then the Brahma Kumaris, which is a well-kept secret, but the Brahma Kumaris is the largest spiritual organization in the world run by women. It's got it's about half and half men and women, but the leaders are women. And what we had in common, we had a lot that wasn't in common, but what we had in common was that we all believed that the best way to build the future was not to troubleshoot the present. And so we were focused on uh, images of the world we wanted to create, and we certainly didn't envision where we are now, and uh, specifically the role that media was playing and how we could elevate that a little bit. So um, we had one question. So what happened? Well, let me just what tell happened? you the question, the yeah. question, Roberta, around which we organized. We had only one question, and we stayed in the same question for 20 years. And the question was, what is the impact of public image making and public storytelling on society? Um, we had about but two it wasn't in the room, and it was intended to happen one time. Um, we didn't really, weren't, we weren't planning a movement. We just thought we'd have this interesting conversation. And in fact, it was a focus of someone's doctoral dissertation. So we had all these papers to fill out. It was a wild day. 200 people went into the night, very animated and hard to shut it down. There was so much interest in the room and it seems that we'd hit a nerve. People really wanted to talk about the role of media. And so that was the beginning of it. And from there, we had conversations all over the world. I noticed in the registrations, two of our old friends from Chile uh, showed up, Mamie Ducci and, um, and um, Mary Belle Vidal. A, a lot of people a, have been in our path yeah. that began to show up. The signature experience was there's, an annual summit in the Catskill Mountains, which we did every year for like 18 or 20 years. So back to you, Roberta appropriately named um, Peace Village. Yeah, exactly. Perfectly named. And we were hosted by the Brahma Kumaris. And I find it fascinating that they have it in their constitution that it, it's led by women. So over the years, um, there were things going on in the world that, um, that were reflected in these conversations, in these summits that we had. Um, go through just a little bit about the, the through line of that. I mean, I remember, for instance, John Funabiki talking about little media and how we found ourselves talking about restorative narrative. I mean, just sort of take us on, on you know, the breadcrumbs of the path that we were on. Well, so what, um, what we were doing was we were asking people in media to consider it not as a job, but as a calling as a vocation. And we were asking them to think about their personal mission in their work and the social impact they wanted, we, they wanted to have with their work. What were they trying to do? And then we would bring in people whose work was um, fascinating from that perspective. You know, the particular mission they were on, the kind of impact they wanted to have. And they were all over the map. I mean, we, we really brought in all kinds of very interesting people over the years, some of them well-known, 
Uh, I remember having June Cohen from TED Talks, who was really fun to listen to. And some um, really you, you wouldn't know, but we, had, we found them, we thought their work was interesting. So we showcased the work, but really it was about dialogue and it was about reflection. And uh, I got to say, reflection was a hard sell in 1999 in media. Nobody, Tell me about it. Nobody was very <laughs> interested in, um, in meditation at that time. We had no headspace or, head or, headspace or calm or any of these big meditation apps. That wasn't where people's head and hearts were. But our premise, and the premise of one of our long-term friends, the Fetzer Foundation, the Fetzer Institute, um, was that if you're going to make a change in the way you think and you're going to make a change in the way you work, you have to be able to go inside and reflect. You have to be able to think it through and really uh, understand what's going on for you and what's behind this desire you have to change and how you're going to motivate in that direction. So we tried all kinds of things. We had Brahma Kumaris leading meditation. We had uh, lamas, Buddhist lamas. We had poets. We had... Uh, people reading samples of their work. We had lots of musicians and dancers over the years. And the point was really to say to people to step outside your space, give yourself a break, and allow yourself to consider what you're up to with your work. And I can and go on some sort of narrative. Do you want to go down there now or do you want to? Um, over, over the years, also, other things emerged like gaming. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, I mean, that was a real surprise. And, and there were some very heated conversations about, about marketing and advertising with journalists in the room who are like, wait a second, you know, it, it, the, the tension there. There were some brilliant um, things being done by marketers, actually, too. The advertising industry is really significant, right? And gaming is significant, too. I think the biggest shift for Images and Voices of Hope came after the shootings in Newtown. Um, and everyone will remember this tragedy, these seven-year-olds, I think there were 29 deaths that morning in December in 2012. And uh, it broke, I think it broke the country's heart. Um, there are many things that break our hearts, but that, that was gut-wrenching for a lot of people. Broke. And in March yeah. of the following year, there was an article in The New Yorker about the paper the paper in Newtown, and the editor of the paper was talking about what he was trying to do. He said, what's the role of the community paper when something like this happens? The New York Times will be there, CNN will be there, everybody, the big ones will be there, but what's the role of the paper that's trying to tell the story of the town? And he decided that it's, the role was to create a redemptive narrative so the town wasn't forever stuck in that day in December it was such tragedy. So I called up one of our board members, John Funabiki, and I asked him, I said, what do you think? Redemptive narrative. And he checked in with his sidekick, Valerie Bush, and they came back and said, how about restorative narrative? And so uh, we did um, lots of work with restorative narrative. We did two colloquiums, three summits, and three cohorts of um, fellows working on defining the genre and on clarifying how to work in this genre. The cohorts under the really brilliant guidance of Jackie Benisonski, who was at Missouri as a professor at that point, and the last one with the support of the Fetzer Institute. So our feeling was that with restorative narrative, it's not a happy story. You tell the new town story, you tell the sad story, but you, your through line, you're tracing the resilience of the players. You're tracing their ability to get back up, get back on their feet and recover. So we spent a lot of time on restorative narrative. I love that word resilience. And that is Somate's, um, that is the name of one of his CDs that we'll talk about a little bit later. I wanna to bring Thomas West in, our um, indefatigable, the P Studio founding executive director. Um, who is on a mission and vision um, about cross-cultural media and you know how how we can create media that will help bring us to peace and so um, we're we're collaborating now which is one of my favorite words basically I feel like part of what's wrong with the world is that there's been so much competition 
And I feel that collaboration can set us free, really. Just finding these nodes, the, the you know, connecting with people where we're on the same mission and have the same vision. And that's what we stumbled across with the Peace Studio. And so we have joined forces. We are in deep collaboration with our, with our boards. We have embraced the name, the Peace Studio, but we are bringing in um, the traditions and past the, the reflection, as Judy said, and, um, and, and what I think is really unique, which is all forms of media that, yeah, advertising, gaming, journalism, all of it matters and music and dance and art. So Thomas, um, talk a little bit about how you landed as the founding director of the Peace Studio and what your vision is, where you want to take it. Yeah, I, I went to Juilliard for my undergrad and um, while I was there, I found myself moving away from singing full time and wanting to think about ways that I could, um, that, you know, I saw so many of my fellow graduates um, having a hard time figuring out you know, how they could use their creative practices to make a difference in the world. And um, what ended up leading me to actually Todd and Maya and, and Jen Gates, the co-founders of Peace Studio, which I'll tell you a little about that founding story in a second, was that I started this uh, organization a couple of years ago called Collaborative Arts Ensemble, um, which was really specifically built on the idea that when we bring artists uh, together across disciplines that we can make uh, we can create a process um, that leads to uh, a product where um, we're, we are telling stories that will uh, enable people to, um, or that, you know, lead to stories where people find themselves um, mm -hmm. uh, understanding, you know, the other artists better and, um, you know, lead to a, a, a stronger, more just and loving world. And, um, and it was, it was, so it was through that experience that I, uh, you know, over the course of creating that organization, um, I ended up getting connected to Todd um, through a friend of his at Juilliard. And, um, and the story of Peace Studios founding is, is really extraordinary. Um, Jen Gates uh, was, um, or my, I should say Maya Satoro, one of our co-founders was a client of Jen Gates. And Todd and Maya went down to Atlanta to hear Maya speak at the Gandhi King Conference. And when Maya goes um, and speaks at conferences, she often does um, this speech where she talks about the importance of peace and peace building being expanded to something that's more about uh, the presence of justice um, rather than being um, just about, um, you know, being just about the um, absence of war or violence. And um, at the end of her speeches, she talks about what's one thing that each person can do to build peace in the world and, um, and sort of challenges the audience to think about that one step they can be taking towards peace. And um, through that, Todd and Jen were sitting there and they said, well, what, what could we do as literary agents? What might we think about um, for, uh, you know, towards building, um, you know, something where we, where we take on Maya's challenge. And that's sort of what led to Peace Studio being created was was out of that conversation, they said, well, why don't, why don't we create something where artists, journalists, and storytellers are given um, the opportunity, the resources to, um, you know, to spread a rejuvenated concept of peace and to think of themselves as peace builders. And so uh, that, that was sort of the initial founding. And, and through that experience, um, our organization really was built similarly to Images and Voices of Hope because it was initially sort of uh, started just with conversations and started with with dialogues like these and um, built you know project by project and um, you know then the of course the opportunity to um, you know collaborate with images and voices of hope was sort of was sort of our first chance to think about um, you know building an organization that was more than just um, you know a volunteer organization but was uh, being driven um, you know, by a team of people that, that had a, a common mission. And, and so that, um, that's sort of what has led us to this point today. You know, I want to ask both, you, both of you, Judy and Thomas, about what is it about media of all kinds that, that helps us make sense of the world in a constructive way? You know, what is it about it that, that 
some media can open hearts and open minds. Um, and that's been our mutual focus, but, but explain it. I think people know this on some level instinctively, right? I mean, so media drives the public discourse. What people watch in media, what movies they watch, what they read, what they, the art they go to, you know, to see is what they talk about at home and at work and you know, on the streets. It drives, it drives the public discourse. And we see that now you know, in, in not always the best ways. Um, that people, people's notion of what the world is like is really dependent on their media. People who watch different media have a different world. And so our uh, premise was that if we helped those who were making the stories and producing and distributing the stories to get clear on their intention and build their capacity to tell stories that had that kind of um, strength-based through line, tell the bad stuff, but have the strength-based through line that we actually could impact the public discourse. That we actually could affect the way people were feeling. And when we uh, began to uh, date the <laughs> peace studio, I don't know what to call it, kind of a dating process, um, there was a lot of similar premise that they had around the arts and the impact of the arts. And we'd always been interested in the arts as well and had had, had a lot of presence with the arts, but not as much as a peace studio. So our intention was the same, to elevate the public discourse. And that's an individual person by person project. You don't elevate the whole public, right? Mind by mind, heart by heart, you help people understand, for one thing, who they really can be, you know, who they are at their best, and then who they are when they're in community and how much impact they can have. Look at what Sami has done as a single musician. You know, I mean, look at Thomas when he chooses, he wants to start a movement in arts. I mean, it's individuals. It's the old um, Margaret Mead quote, right? Never doubt that a small group of people can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. So you're just saying, given how, and this was before uh, social media. I mean, when we started, there was no social media. There was no Facebook, et cetera. So at that point, it was already impactful. Now, you know, I mean, it's, it's huge. So it's cr trying to get people to be conscious about the way they're thinking and what they're sending into the public space, that all of it has a vibrational impact. And it, the words that they speak, the images they put out there, et cetera. And to try to do everything we could to raise it up. You know, I think about um, one of the aspects of Images and Voices of Hope that was most deeply moving and, and transformational for me was also supported by the Fetzer Institute was the International Thought Leader Dialogue. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where we gathered with about 30 journalists from around the world. This was with my ethics guru, um, Bob, um, Dr. Bob, I like um, thinking about um, this I believe essays really is what it was about but what is a what is it as a journalist that motivates you you know what what is it that is most deeply ingrained in terms of what your calling is as a as a journalist and I remember feeling you know we all meditated deeply on this and we wrote essays that um, yeah sure are are still worth putting out in the world, I think. I do remember feeling a little bit um, uncomfortable about mine because everybody was talking about really thoughtful journalism, things like holding the powerful accountable or, um, you know, justice and, and, you know, writing about peace. But, and mine was tenacity. I wrote about tenacity, but, um, but it is what um, sort of got me bounding out of bed in the morning to, to do the kind of journalism I was doing but it really changed my heart. It softened my heart in terms of thinking more about, well, what do people, instead of like, what's wrong, what's right? How can we tell untold stories about what's right and where the solutions are? And there, was a, there were a lot of people who flowed through these summits 
who also had transformational experiences and, and got together and collaborated together and things grew out of it. Not that we were very good at capturing them. But um, Thomas, how would you describe in terms of that aspect of, for you, how you look at media making in terms of its impact in the world through the arts? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think what Judy said is really on point that it's, it's challenging to um, think about the arts, you know, holistically changing behaviors or, or being, um, you know, being something that, that could, could alone um, shift society to become more peaceful and more just and, and, and see a world that is, um, you know, where people are less divided. But I think it's a critical first step. And where, for, where I feel like I've seen it the most is in, um, you know, just from my personal experience has been in concert halls and in, uh, and in theaters where you, as an audience member, you come and you're, you're opting in to being there. You're already putting yourself in a space where um, you're opening up your heart and mind to some kind of message or some kind of music or, or, or something that, um, you know, that you have, you know, that you've chosen to experience and, and, and hopefully embrace in some way. And so I think, um, I like to think of it as sort of another world that you're being transported into that takes you out of reality for a moment and you might just, um, it's, it's a, it's a space where everyone, um, you know, is, is, is brought together and, and can be seen as, uh, or, or can, you know, can, experience this thing together it's like this unifying moment um and and so i think that for me is why the arts have to be a part of the conversation uh, why media makers have to be a part of the conversation because um they are they they have this incredible power over over how culture and history is shaped um you know that it that it's it's kind of like it's like the key that's going to unlock where we go after that as a world um, because, you know, that's, that's where the conversations can be started. And, I, and I've seen it, you know, time and time again, I'll, the, the last thing I'll, I'll say is that I, uh, one of the first performances we did with Collaborative Arts Ensemble, um, down in Montgomery, Alabama, um, we did a, a show, um, I'm a Southerner and we did a show um, called Letters from the American South. And, um, it was built by some of my friends. We were all, all Southerners, um, different backgrounds, uh, different races, um, different genders, we, but we came together to talk about what, you know, living and growing up in the South meant to each one of us. And in that performance that we put together, um, you know, a lot of the audience that we were performing for was white. Um, but there was a, you know, there was, there were moments where we, where we sang um, a song that was, you know, really familiar, like Georgia on my mind. Um, and then the next moment we brought in texts from Brian Stevenson from the Equal Justice Initiative um, talking about how far we still have to go with racial reconciliation in this country. And, um, you know, there was something, we, we did that to find a way that it wouldn't be heavy handed for the audience, a way for them to um, to, to start the conversation. We would do dialogue afterwards. And we, we got, I got countless emails after that performance of just people saying, well, like, you know, I, I just, I came to hear, you know, George on my mind, but I left with this thing where I feel like I can go home and talk to my kids differently at the dinner table tonight. And, you know, that's just an individual reaction. But I think there's something to be said for, um, you know, for, for creating these little sparks because they, they create ripple effects and then more and more artists go out into the world or more and more media makers go out into the world and create change. And I think that's what, um, that's, that's why it's movement building and that's like why we're, why we exist and why, why we came together in many ways. Um, Judy, you mentioned appreciative inquiry. Um, but I'd like for you to say a little bit more about that because that was also a thread for us in terms of the types of dialogues that we had. And also, um, again, I, I bring up the Fetzer Institute and its support of the restorative narratives and, and what that whole you know, program was in terms of having restorative narrative fellows and the kind of work that they accomplished over the years. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there were two big uh, pieces to what we did that were sort of signature and they were odd at the time. One of them was um, that uh, at the time that we started and we were using appreciative inquiry, which is a strengths-based approach to things, um, 
it was it was part of a larger movement. The positive psychology movement took off in the mid really late 80s, mid 90s, and we were reading the research and we were seeing that what they were saying is that when people are in positive emotional states, and this could include at the end of a concert, I know at the end of Hamilton, I was on my feet, right? I love this. All of us, really, these, dip, these moments, these theater moments or these concert moments where your heart is racing and all things are possible, right? Well, so what the positive psychologist said is that when we're in positive emotional states, joy, gratitude, love, appreciation, awe, wonder, all of those states, that it has an immediate impact on the personality. We are more pro-social. We are more creative. We generate more ideas. We act on those ideas. So all we were saying was, well, if we could put people in positive emotional states, then they would be more capable to do things in their communities and in their families. That's all we were saying. That if this is true, if what they're saying is true, and the research now is, it's huge now. At the time, you know, you had Csikszentmihalyi writing Flow, and you had Marty Seligman starting the American Psychological Association uh, segment on positive psychology. But now it's a monster. And all the research is saying the same thing, that when we're sad or afraid or anxious, we constrict. We, we become withdrawn. We become, uh, we don't generate so many ideas. We're, we're uh, actually smaller and uh, not as smart. And that when we're in these other states, we are literally smarter and more creative and can do more. So the idea was that could we mobilize up the public space to create more capacity through working with media and the arts. That was the essence. Betzer, gosh, they were just such good friends. They stayed with us throughout. And part of it was that not only were we about dialogue and about strengths-based inquiry, we were also about reflection and that's where they live. Um, they, they are deeply committed to reflection and so uh, because we stayed there, you know, when we started, it was really hard. By the end, it was standing room only in the retreats. You know, the room was packed and people were happily in that space. So I think the world has changed a lot since we started 20 years ago. Yeah, I mean, the whole idea of reflection and meditation was um, uh, uh, felt awkward back there when you were inviting these um, serious journalist types and they were like, now we're going to we're going to spend some time meditating and reflecting. It was, um, but now it's, the world is doing it. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the questions, and, and Randy Fiat, I have to say thank you, Randy, who is um, our fearless producer on, our, on this first webinar and has been with the Images and Voices of Hope community, now the Peace Studio community um, from very early on and has brought many wonderful artists and, and journalists and musicians to us. She um, is gathering questions from the beating hearts out there and says that there, there are questions about what is strength-based media. So can you say a little more about that, Judy? Oh, Strengths-based media. The strengths movement, uh, you would recognize, I mentioned some of the names in it, you know, Chicksamahai in his book, Flow. The Gallup people, people at Gallup are all about strengths inventories. Yeah, it used to be when you were a little kid, if they tested you and you came out that you weren't very good at science, they'd have you work very hard at science to try to catch up. But with the strengths movement, what happened was they began to say, you know, everybody has strengths. So play to your strengths. Learn how to focus on the things that, that you're good at. And it set in motion strengths-based education, strengths-based leadership, Peter Drucker, and so we were doing the media arm of that. It's not happy news because bad things happen and people need to hear about bad things. But what it is, is it's focusing on the aspect of the human experience that brings value forward. You know, I'm remembering uh, recently, I've mentioned John Funabiki before, but he sent me the book of Mr. Rogers Poetry. And this is, we've been talking a lot about Fred Rogers lately as these movies have been coming out and what a figure he was in the childhood experience. And again, seems silly. I mean, he was almost embarrassed to watch it as a parent. It was like, oh, 
this is so silly. But actually, it wasn't silly. Actually, it was about virtue, and it was about character, and it was about feeling good with who you were. If you were a four-year-old and you were in a, a family situation that was tough, and so it brought, you know, the, the notion was to bring into the public space a different way of thinking about media. You know, we had this news model where only anomalies were worthy of, of news. Now, I would say it's harder to do this. You can't be a lazy storyteller to tell a strength-based story. You have to be a really good storyteller. And so that's why we worked on both craft as well as the, uh, the through line, you know, could you stay with a, a through line of resilience? And it also requires really understanding editors because they've got to hang with you as you stay with the story. Um, but we had a lot of benefactors early on. I'm remembering we did a lot in Miami, Florida for years. You know, we still have an active conversation in Miami and Robin Gibb and the Bee Gees were some early benefactors of ours. Uh, Robin himself, um, and his kids and we used his home for early meetings so we had good friends all along the way that stayed with us as we built this out because it was a really it was an unusual position and it took a lot of work and a lot of faith um one of the questions from the field judy is how do you tell a strength-based media story about something like what happened in minneapolis this week you know a tragedy of a, you know a murder how do you um, move beyond the sort of, um, you know, saying this is what happened at 10 o'clock at night, you know, as, as stand up um, and, and cover the civil unrest and do it in a way that, um, that is strength based. You know, I'm remembering what's the name of the um, woman in New Zealand, the president, president or prime minister in New Zealand? What's her name? Oh, anyone have it at your fingertips? Well, I did at the moment that she was stand out when the mosques were attacked, but that's how you do it. That's how you do it. You tell the story. This is what happened. This is the, this, these are the, the fatalities. This, this is the injuries. This is where we are. But then she never mentioned the attackers again. And I don't think she mentioned them by name. Her entire focus was, how are we going to rebuild? How are we going to pull together? How are we going to be a community at this point? So they got what they needed. They did the same thing in Newtown. They didn't talk about the shooter's name. This was a very troubled kid. His name never came up, at least in the Newtown B and the other media that was working to tell these restorative narratives. They focused on those who were surviving, how they were coming together as a community, how do you get through heartbreak and tragedy? What begins to move you towards resolution? One of our board members, Kevin Becker, who's a trauma psychologist, has been hugely helpful to us with our fellows talking about the, uh, the contours of tragedy and when you can make your most powerful interventions. You know, we've got a lot of bad things happening, you know, and we have to find ways to tell stories about those things that get us up off our knees and get us feeling like we can engage and that we can have hope in our heart and we can have faith and that we can believe in each other and we can do powerful things together. And so you just, it's a step at a time. You know, it's not a formula. There are guidelines, there are principles, but it's not a formula and it takes a really artful storyteller to do it well. But it has, it's a matter of the heart. It's not just craft. If you just are good at craft, you'll never be able to do this. I was thinking earlier today about one of the um, one of our community members, um, Sherry Turkle, who um, came and, and spoke to at one of the summits. And she wrote this book, I pulled it off the shelf today, Alone Together. And it's so prescient. I mean, she wrote it back in, uh, I believe it's 2011, why we expect more from technology and less from each other. But here we are, you know, all of us on the, on the screen. And I think Sherry uh, does not allow computers in, in her classroom at MIT, which is quite a, um, you know, that's, that's heretical at MIT. But she wants people to focus. And, and I'm curious about what you both think uh, in terms of where we are at this, at this time during this pandemic where we are um, being asked to keep our distance from each other. And I wish they didn't call it 
social distancing. I wish it was called physical distancing because socially we are on Zoom all the time. But what thoughts do you have? Um, you're both spending a lot of time on Zoom and, and um, how is that impacting your minds and your hearts? And, and uh, I see Swanee Hunt, Ambassador Swanee Hunt is joining us. Um, so just a quick reflection on that about, yeah, we're on the screen all the time. Yeah, I can, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, well, I think, uh, you know, as you said, Roberta, um, you know, before this pandemic even started, we were already experiencing this epidemic of loneliness, uh, you know, across the United States. I think in January 2020, Cigna published a report saying that two thirds of U.S. adults and you, you know, and were reported as being lonely. Uh, a good friend of, of, of Todd, um, one of our co-founders is Varun Soni, um, the Dean of Religious Life at USC. And he, uh, when I met with him last fall um, in LA, he told me um, stories of how he's teaching friendship classes now to uh, Generation Z, you know, at, at USC, teaching them how to make eye contact, teaching them how to, uh, you know, how to build friendships right now. And, um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a challenging time in our world. Um, and what I think I can speak to um, in this moment is, is sort of what Peace Studio has been thinking about and, and responding to um, as we thought about what we might do as an organization to come together in this moment um, as a community and to both support the artists, media makers that have lost work in their jobs and also have um, you know, and they're also the, uh, you know, the world at large um, that is looking for these strength-based stories and looking for content um, that might spark, uh, you know, more justice that would ultimately lead to peace. Um, we envisioned a project called uh, 100 Offerings of Peace. And over the next uh, four months between January 1st and September 21st, International Day of Peace, we are... Um, commissioning 100 content creators from around the world uh, to create a piece of content that responds to what peace means to them right now during COVID-19. Um, when I'm sitting on the phone a lot of times during the day with uh, various CEOs of other peace building organizations, something I keep hearing from them is that, you know, peace building um, is not getting the attention it deserves right now in the media. It's not part of the conversation of how we're going to make it through this crisis. And I really hope that that is a role that Peace Studio will play over these next few months is through these stories, uh, through these artists that we are commissioning and through these, these, um, these writers and these storytellers that we will find, um, you know, we will find peace elevated, that, that the media will pay more attention to, um, you know, to what it means as, um, you know, as a, as a broader concept, you know, something that um, obviously is so key to Ivo and, and is something that we are so proud to be continuing on as a shared organization is uh, restorative narrative. And I think that, um, you know, Maya is a, a huge proponent of positive peace building. And they're really, they're really similar. The idea that peace is being, you know, being focused on building the infrastructure for a more just and loving world that it's about like the attitudes and the, you know, the structures that we're creating for peace to flourish long term rather than just um, the absence of war. And so, um, you know, for me, this project is really um, is, is, is leading us in that direction and is, is a continuation of, of um, you know, of everything that, that Ivo has really stood for and everything that we hope Peace Studio will be. Um, so I want to bring Ambassador Swanee Hunt into the conversation. Just say a few words about the adventure you had in Rwanda with artists, um, American artists and Rwandan artists. And then... Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, please do. Welcome, yes. Swanee. Yeah, Ambassador Hunt. First of all, it's such a pleasure to to meet you for the first time. I've I've heard uh, so many wonderful things about you, and I've I've read your book and admired you for for so long. And I'm uh, it's a pleasure we're getting to connect in this. Thank you. Thank you. And please call me Swanee, okay? okay. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, you know, speaking of of Rwanda, that was that was how I really came into the Peace Studio for the first time. Was I was invited to. Um, help produce uh, a project for the organization this past summer. We took five American artists um, to Rwanda to create this piece that we call Generation 25. It was all artists under the age of 25, Rwandan artists and American artists um, coming together to 
uh, think about, um, you know, both the, the, the Rwandan genocide and, and what that means for people born out of the genocide in Rwanda, how it affects us as Americans, um, but also to be thinking about, you know, the, the concerns of young people in the world today and, and how we could create a piece of theater that would really, um, you know, that, that would be both uh, meaningful to the, the creators themselves, um, you know, that, that, that they were entering into this really difficult process across cultures, you know, they'd never, yeah. most of the people we brought had never been to Africa, never been to Rwanda before, and they make theater really differently there. They make it in, in a didactic kind of way. I mean, and, and we were always craving more moments of levity and, and how, but how could we find, how could we find our voices together in this experience? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what I found was that the, uh, the impact that it had on, you know, the artists themselves, you know, our American team um, was, you know, just as amazing and impactful as what I think the audience took away from it because they entered into discomfort and, and, um, and the challenge of creating art in Rwanda, you know, and, and through that, I think it created this whole new product for for the the audience themselves where they they saw like what it looks like for people to come together across difference and across cultures and to see like see it in action you know the artists themselves were actually um they had engaged in the difficult work uh so that that like the audience could take that small step too and that's um and that was you know it was incredibly powerful um i mean most of us just mm -hmm. broke down crying on the last day because it was so mm -hmm. Um, it was so meaningful, but I, um, but yeah, I, I really, you know, they, they're dear collaborators of us now and we're hoping that we'll continue to work with Hope Azeda and, and her community uh, for, for a long time. Yeah, well, you're experiencing there, but I have experienced over 17 years and, um, and I, last time I was there, the first lady invited me to come and she's been doing an initiative there working with young people. And so imagine that there's a stadium and it's filled with probably 3,000, 4,000 uh, teenagers. And so they all get, they all start singing and they're singing. And, and you know that the two major groups are Hutu and Tutsi. And the Hutus were the perpetrators of the genocide, okay. And as you know, 10% of the population was, was wiped out you know, with machetes, et cetera, and three in three months, which would be like 35 million Americans in three months. I mean, if we, if we want to get real about it. So there, you, I tell you that because it, it's meaningful when you imagine these six teenagers with their microphones and they're singing and they're singing for all these thousands. And, oh, I'm sorry about the sirens. It's probably the vice president going to his um, abode from the White House. Anyway. Um, I mean, DC, obviously. So, so these teenagers that are there and they're singing, I am not Hutu, I am not Tutsi, I am Rwandan. And they're singing and they're, it's like, you know, it, you can either think of it like Hitler Youth or you can think of it as this warm, spectacular coming together um, and, and all the power that, that happens, you know, when, when you, you get that concentration of joy, that concentration of hope. And I, I was listening to what you were saying about uh, being alone together. And there, there's so much paradox there. I, I'm thinking about, Roberta, is it okay if I go on for a few minutes? I'm gonna ask you to stop because um, not everybody knows who you are. And I just wanna say um, that Swanee Hunt um, is a Renaissance woman who I have known since uh, 2001 when I took her class at, at Harvard. And she's written books about Bosnia. She's written a, a memoir, Half-Life of a Zealot. And this is the book that um, I pulled off the shelf today, Rwandan Women Rising. And this to me is the ultimate. I've been talking about this book since you wrote it and you spent 17 years writing it. And I was reading it while you were writing it. Yeah. Um, it is um, the ultimate restorative narrative in that it's about a country that suffered through the tragedy of genocide and has been built up by women. And to coin a, a phrase from Swanee, um, because she had this organization for many years that I loved called Women Waging Peace. And so how have women waged peace in Rwanda 
to get it to the to the point where it is the number one country in the world for women's leadership? Yeah, well, first of all, before the genocide, if if we were all together and there was, you know, Tom was there and, and maybe Jim or whatever, the women would be totally silent. It was taboo for women to speak, even in their home if there was a man there. And I mean, other than husband or whatever. And um, it, so to go from that into the chaos and the chaos cracks open the culture and that's key because you had to have a structural disaster and then the women surged into the bre break, breach. And that is what, it was that courage that they had. And when they did that, they couldn't like look for, you know, I'm, I'm looking for another Tutsi to, you know, whatever. It, so many had been slaughtered. You just dealt with whatever you had. And, um, and so a friend of mine was going around, they were like, um, I don't know, 600,000 orphans, and she was going around, we got to get the, oh, you know, here, you have three, okay, now here, two more, you have five children, and you, you have one, oh, well, Judy, you've got, you've got four now, and she's just going around, and then she's lying in bed thinking, I just distributed, you know, all these Hutu children to these Tutsi uh, families, and it didn't matter, it didn't matter, and it was that kind of tiny little pieces that all added up together. And I mean, I, you know, I, I came up with, I don't know, hundreds of examples of this in this book from, from just the women talking. I didn't want to go in with a narrative. I just wanted them to tell their stories because that's where the power is. It's people telling their own stories. And I'll just tell you one. Okay, I, I just want to share, because I, it goes, what the thread for me in the book is, is about collaboration. Yeah. These women collaborated with each other. They did not compete. When they got that 30% quota to be in parliament, they, they, um, when they were running again, they didn't run on the quota. They ran against the men and had the women come up from the villages. And if, if you can just describe a little bit about... Sure. Sure. Well, as I said, if, if there were men, the women couldn't speak. So the women couldn't be on the village council. So they said, well, hell, you know, well, they didn't say hell. We'll start our own councils. We'll have women-only councils. Now, that doesn't sound so important until you realize that there were 14,852 villages. That's what Rwanda is. So you had 14,852 women's councils. And then and they had run for a place and they ran for the next level and they and et cetera, the next level. And at the top, they had run for office against each other, with each other five times. And that's the group that came into the parliament and what you were saying exactly, Roberta, after a short period of time, the women who were in those 30% set aside seats, they said, hey, you know what? I have name recognition. I know this country. I'll run against the men and I'll leave this seat open for my sisters. And it's the next group from the villages who went into those set aside seats. And these women are now 64 frigging percent of the parliament. And it's like the next one, I don't know, on the list is probably in like and in seven or something. Right. And it's all about collaboration. And the women were collaborating with the men. So when they had a major bill to stop domestic violence, which is rampant, they made sure that more than half of the sponsors were men, even though the women had two thirds of the seats. So that's, what, that's what's so important about collaboration. You've got to go to the unlikely. You're, find the unlikely allies. I, and I love that you also um, bring it back to the soul of storytelling. Mm -hmm. also yeah, and, and that was the power. And by the way, I never asked in all of my interviews, I never say, asked a question like, gee, what does peace mean to you? I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> that's not where you get power. It, or I didn't say, well, gee, what about the men in your life? Were they supportive? Just say, hey, tell me what happened. And let them talk. And they'll come up with the most powerful story that you can possibly have. I want to bring Samate back 
and um, and I want to bring him back with my new word, and he has to correct me if I'm not pronouncing it right. Murembe is the Luganda language word for peace. Is that right, Samite? Yes. Yeah. You, um, I um, want to mention to everyone your your beautiful CD, Resilience, which. Um, you know, blends this beautiful African traditional music and um, with stories and hope and tolerance and 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 your whole, um, you know, you are doing everything around music to heal, and and so I, I also want to talk about your your um, humanitarian work, but would you like to play for us again first? Oh, you let 
Obaka wa mutunzi Oli ne miri mojokola Oli ne miri mojoku tukiriza Kareto Oh Samate uh your your music is so heartfelt and so beautiful that song Re resilience um it's from your resilience cd is just um heart stopping it's just it's so cool. i also want to direct people to your website so that they can learn more about you and about your music and about your humanitarian work so it is summit s a m i t e dot com right yeah talk a little bit about the um ugandan humanitarian work that you're doing the musicians for world harmony i grew up in uganda i grew up at the time when we had a dictator named idi amin dada who came to power and changed everything uganda used to be one of the most beautiful countries green everywhere birds singing and when idi amin came to power with a lot of shooting the birds stopped singing and um soon we lost family members lost a brother lost uh, my stepdad and my friends lost their loved ones too and eventually i became a refugee in kenya and i noticed that in the refugee camp there was no music there was no entertainment whatsoever it was very sad eventually i moved to the united states in a little town called ethica and one day at the end of a concert i was doing state New York I was invited to go by a gentleman who thought I could use my music to help people in Africa um find some healing I didn't know what I was going to do but we ended up in Liberia in an IDP camp internally displaced persons camp and there the children looked so lost so sad because they had seen so much death and so much suffering that they just stared just like this flies went in and around their eyes they didn't even blink and i noticed that after i played a little flute solo for them the children their eyes started to focus again. They would pull on my shirt and say, "Hey, Mister, we have a song. Can we sing for you?" And the mothers soon had the children singing, and they came in and joined, taking over the whole show with their own music. And this happened everywhere we went, every refugee camp we visited. We realized that music had the healing power to heal even those who had seen the worst. That's when. Musicians for World Harmony was born to help people sing again. Refugees, former child soldiers, mothers in war-torn places, and even in the U.S. with people that have dementia. That's what Musicians for World Harmony is about. I want to say that the music was really, really beautiful, um, and I am I am a better person because of having listened to you. Oh. oh. Tomate was honored with an award of appreciation by Images and Voices of Hope at the last summit last June. And he had all of us standing on our feet singing and dancing and smiling. Um he is a a, a peace builder through his music. And I hope that everybody listening will go to samate.com and read about it in terms of what he's doing in terms of working with with musicians. So, um I want to talk a little about peace building to go back to Th Thomas's work right now in terms of um a um a hundred a uh, hundred acts of peace that um we have judges who are who are um exploring it right now in terms of who will be getting these awards. Um say a little bit about what peace building means to you thomas in terms of doing this work absolutely um yeah i remember uh, i don't know if if tony carr is on this uh or not but i remember yeah. i think he's not okay no he signed up 
Oh, he did. Okay. Awesome. Well, just because I remember talking to, to Tony about this recently about what, what peace building means to me. I think uh, before I, I came to Peace Studio, um, you know, I had, I had honestly always thought about peace in terms of just its dictionary definition about like the absence of, of war or violence. I'd always thought about like peace within in terms of, uh, you know, um, thinking about like, you know, moments in my life where I felt I felt most peaceful, like a, in terms of a feeling. And I think uh, what has been so inspiring to me about Maya and about joining this organization is seeing that term um, on one hand, uh, you know, meeting artists and storytellers and, and various people through this organization that's, that think that, that peace is so urgent to them, you know, that peace is not um, this amorphous thing to them or, or, or just like, a, you know, reading a great book with a glass of lemonade on a hot summer day. It's, it's really, um, it's, it's like everything. And it, 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 it's, um, it's so urgent and they need people to understand how urgent it is um, because it is, uh, because you can't have justice in our world without peace. Um, you can't love and, and uh, you know, and have compassion towards others um, without it, you know, without, um, you know, without a goal of, of peace in mind, you know, without, uh, you know, seeing, um, thinking, you know, thinking every day or, ch I mean, it's, it's a choice that we opt into, but it's something that is, is leading us um, in, in to, uh, to that ripple effect. And I, I feel like that's what, um, when I think about the work of Peace Studio, I'm really thinking about how can artists, journalists, and storytellers be the spark to light the fire that, that will really, um, you know, lead to, uh, a change in our world over the next um, over the next decade and, and beyond, where where we um, where we uh, you know where we are seeing um, actively more and more people coming together um, across across differences across countries, um, thinking of of um, you know everyone is as a human being first and foremost, and and uh, you know that's something that Hope Azeda really taught me in Rwanda is that. Uh, you know, she always, um, you know, she always just talked about our shared humanity. That was the term that she used, you know, that when we were, when we were creating art, um, we weren't Rwandans, we weren't Americans, we were, we were human beings. And I think um, that's the space that, that media makers put us into. It's, they have that possibility. Um, but, you know, but peace, peace is a choice. And it's, it's one that I, uh, that can become um, you know, the, the, and that can lead each person to take tangible actions um, if they're inspired to do so uh, toward, towards justice and towards standing up and making their voice heard. Um, and I feel like uh, we need an organization like Peace Studio to, um, you know, to, to help galvanize that, that effort, um, to come alongside, to collaborate, as you would say, Roberta, uh, with others, you know, towards that, towards that end. Um, and I think our 100 Offerings of Peace project is, is, is that, is going to do that. And it's going to build off the work um, that Ivo was doing for 20 years. Um, and I wanted to, to throw out that Samite is one of our 100 commissions, which we are incredibly proud and excited uh, for, for him to be. And, and um, when you hear uh, both, um, you know, we're, we'll share a link to his website after this, but when you hear his offering, uh, you're going you're gonna to be amazed and, and deeply moved. And, and, and I, I'm certain you're going to be thinking about what that step you can be taking towards peace, um, like Samite does every day with his, with his art making. Uh, so that's, that's, yeah, that's it for me. I want, to, I want to share something from Rwandan Women Rising. Right at the very um, beginning, there is a quote from Elijah Inyumba um, that Swani has talked about many times. Um, and um, at the, it, it says, we have to be agents of peace. We can't just have peace delivered to us on a plate. And so these hundred acts of peace and, um, you know, asking, calling to people to be peacemakers in the world. Um, I want to ask Swanee um, what, what that means to you in terms of acts of peace. I mean, you, you um, started this thing, you know, with... Um, women as agents, women as agents of, not, it, women as agents of peace, yeah. yeah. I've worked in about 60 um, war zones, 
And uh, everywhere I go, everywhere I go, there are women leaders, right? And whoever they are, they're, they're at the top. And I don't do the grassroots work, which I admire so much and have done in the past. But in this case, being very targeted to say, you know, well, you're the head of this NGO, why aren't you? The, uh, why aren't you in the parliament? Well, you're in the parliament, why aren't you the uh, foreign minister? Or why aren't you the, uh, the prime minister? Well, you're the prime minister, why aren't you at the negotiating table? You know, just constantly pushing women up because we know that they have different understandings of conflict and of working across lines, et cetera, all the things we know, and there are lots of them. Um, but th it's also structural, Roberta, for me, and it's political. And so when I don't, I can't work in terms of an idea without thinking about who in the political world here in our country, at the UN, in other countries, who are, are the people who are promoting and enabling peace. And so that's one of the reasons I'm as, as involved as I am. And, and the last thing I'll say, which is related, is it's structural. And so I can talk about my heart, but what the women in Rwanda did is they, there were 800,000 men in prison and there were only 50 lawyers, right? So the women set up something called gachacha, which means on the grass. It's a, um, it, I was there, I mean, I went to three different gachacha meetings. And so here you have all of these villagers on a hillside in their bright, bright cloth um, clothes. Most of them can't read. And so they're about, five men who are brought in and there are four judges and the four judges are there listening to what's happening and the men are saying I did this I'm so sorry or I didn't do anything etc so somebody in the audience if you will on the hillside says he's telling the truth I was with him and we were in the fields and we were tilling a field okay he didn't massacre all the people in the next house and somebody else says, that's not true. I was in those fields too. He was not there and you were not there. And then somebody else says, you know, young man, I've known you since before you were born. And I know the look in your eye when you're lying and when you're telling the truth and you're lying. And all of a sudden there is this transformation and he has to decide what he's going to do. And if he is, I know saying, you know, found guilty, I started to say convicted, he's got to rebuild the thatched roof of, let's say, every house in the village. But so it's a transformative uh, process. Two million people went through that, that court system on the grass and the women put it together. And that's how you ended up with lasting peace. Beautiful, Swanee. Um, I wanna ask our, our beating hearts out there that we can't see, but we know they are there, um, to put in the chat um, any thoughts about their acts of peace, their peacemaking. Because um, Randy, Randy Fiat, our um, extraordinary creative volunteer and um, producer here is going to create a poem out of um, the thoughts that you have about peace and we're going to send it out to all of you and so it would be a nice collaboration actually to have um, what peace means to you and to reflect on that um, and just give us those words um, and we also want to hear from you about where you would like for us to take this this is the first of a dialogue series and who you would like to hear from and what you'd like to hear about and how we can engage you in terms of participating in this process. We really want this to be about creating a garden, planting seeds for tomorrow. Um, and you know, we're, we're living through these um, very troubling times now where we are alone together as Sherry Turkle would say. <laughs> and um, and so uh, Randy is going to make a poem of your reflections and, and share it with all of us down the road. Um, Judy, can I bring you into this in terms of um, your, how you think about peace in terms of media making? Well, first, I just want to tell Swanee, I just am knocked out 
by the work you've done. You won't remember this, but I was sitting in the front row in a concert in Boston long ago. I was invited there by Debbie Leff, both Roberta and I know. I was reading a book on Serbia and you walked by, looked at my book and asked me what I was doing reading a book on Serbia because you were active there at that time. Mm -hmm. So I know that your commitment to war zones is deep and long. Cool. And, um, and it's really impressive. And I'm really glad you've written about it. It's interesting that the subject of women coming up so much tonight, that wasn't in our script, um, but between the Brahma Kumaris and their role uh, with so many, you know, being led by women and so many, uh, so much active. I it use the woman in New Zealand as the example when I was talking about how to tell the Minneapolis story. You know, I think peace is active but I think if you don't have access to it inside of you, you're not going to really be able to be authentic about it in the world. You know, you have to be able to locate it. And I think it's very tricky, the relationship between peace and righteous indignation, because there are things that are really distressing going on in the world. And um, they hurt our feelings. They hurt us. They hurt our hearts. And uh, they make us sad. They make us shocked. And um, the last thing we feel we can muster in a moment like that is peace. And that's what was going on for Curtis when he was trying to tell the story of Newtown. You know, it's, it's like, how do, you, how do you begin to move the town back to the peaceful place it was when it has been so harmed? And whether we're talking, um, you know, there's so many infractions, I don't even want to go down that list, but just to say that, that uh, man's unkindness and harm to men, you know, and I don't mean here gender, I just humanity's unkindness to humanity um, is at such a, a, a stunning level of um, kind of uh, scope that you can feel overwhelmed by it. You know, it's possible to feel so displaced by it. And I think this is why the mobilization of media um, because it reaches everyone. It reaches students. It reaches, I've got grandchildren who are 15 who are way more media savvy than I am, way more, you know, plugged in. Um, it reaches everyone. It reaches all of us. And I'm remembering that concert that night that your husband conducted, Swanee. It was really moving. You know, music moves us. Theater moves us. Stories move us. Mm -hmm. And when we're moved, we have the capacity to do something. Mm -hmm. And I, I, would, I would just say that I really think, you know, one more time around to why I think reflective practice is so important. Sometimes the only thing we can do is take ourselves back to a place where we can work from. Sometimes we've been so distressed by what we've seen that, we, that, that to stabilize and center ourselves is the challenge before we can do anything else. Because we are afraid to open our mouths. I mean, we, we, we don't know what will come out because we're so shocked and disappointed. And so to be able to go back to restabilize ourselves, and this is really where, um, where meditation comes in. You know, the ability to locate yourself inside yourself. Who am I really? You know, that I am peace and that I can work from that place and touch others. And I feel like that we have to start with that, that place. And then from there, those people who are gifted in the ways that everyone here is gifted, Sami Tay with his music, Thomas with his music and his organizational skills, Swanee with her movement building and writing. I mean, everyone brings what they have, right? You bring the thing you have. And Roberta, you're, I, I think your gift is you're, you're igniting people. I mean, you have this ability to light up the room. So I just feel like we start with peace and then we bring what we have. And with what we have, we make that offering into the public space. And we stay with it. It takes faith. It won't work right away. And sometimes it doesn't work then at all. And you have to come back. But the tenacity to go to your virtue and the faith that this will work and that peace is innate in us. We are fundamentally peaceful. Our, our distressing behavior is an anomaly. That's not who we are. And so that faith as we keep working. You know, I, I would double click 
Judy, I love what you what you've been saying. And although gender was not in the in the script when we talked about what are we going to talk about, um, it is fascinating how it's come up. And thinking about the crisis that we're in now with COVID, and that those countries that are managing managing this crisis in the best way are led by women, from New Zealand to you know. Um, all of the the top countries are are um, facing the crisis with women leaders and doing a, a bit better than certainly than we are. Not not getting get into politics here, but um, st sticking sticking with peace. <laughs> and I misspoke, Swanee. Um, it is women waging peace, which is my favorite. I just I love that. What, what did you say? I said. Um, I don't know. I don't want to say it again. Agents for peace. What you meant was women waging peace. Yeah. It's women waging peace, which is lovely. There's something very active and strength based in, in that terminology. And I know that you've transitioned, just as we're in transition all of the time, into um, having an institute that, please talk about how you switched from women waging peace to. Um, and a more collaborative kind of sound. Sure, sure. Uh, we had worked in all of these countries. We had thousands of women that we had who had come to be with me, teach my course with me, uh, speak at Harvard, et cetera, et cetera. And then I had gone out in the field, et cetera, and so literally thousands of women. And then from the very early point, uh, part of, of this building, this movement, what I realized is we actually have the women who are competent. That, yes, fine tuning here and there. The problem is getting them into the power to get to the negotiation table, because if they're not there, you're going to have a war that keeps going. So you, as you can tell, I'm very much into structure. And who controls who gets to, to the negotiating table? It's not even the people in that country the leaders, it's the outsiders, the Americans, the Australians, or whoever is hosting those peace talks. And they will not make sure that they have anything like an equal uh, basis unless you push and push and push on them. So that was the play. It was to get the, the um, policymakers and convince them. And we couldn't do it from Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I moved here to DC and, um, and so we changed the name and we called it in, uh, security because DC people love that. And then we call it inclusive, inclusive security because inclusive, they have no idea what that means. So hopefully it piqued their interest. So we're collaborative. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And you know, it's, we got a law passed a couple of years ago, we got a law passed which is why so the whole thing like, oh, gee, it's going to take an act of Congress to get such and such. We have a law passed that requires that the U.S. have an action plan, meaning plan across all of the agencies, multi, um, multi-tiered, multi you know, combined budgets, et cetera. And there are about seven parts of the U.S. government that are part of this. And they have to come up with this plan that has to be approved by Congress every year. That's now, great. Mind you, the last two years have been rough. And, and so, you know, the best made plans. But we, so we have to stay with it. That's the thing. You can't let a downturn in the political environment stop you. You just can't. Mm -hmm. who, who talked about tenacity? Was that you, Judy? No, that was my, that was my um, story that I wrote when we did the Thought Leader Dialogue was about tenacity as a journalist. That was mm -hmm. my... I have to say, it's been wonderful. I can feel the beating hearts out there in our community of Images and Voices of Hope and, and with the Peace Studio. And I'm so grateful to all of you out there and in here. And um, we're going to say goodbye, but it's not for long. This is going to be a continuing dialogue. So thank you all from the bottom of my heart to all of your hearts and stay safe, stay well, stay sane. And thank you for joining us. You're great. You're all great. You're all beautiful. Thank you. Bye-bye.